Okay, thank you very much. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for joining us. We have a few more people coming in. All right, thank you. Good evening to everybody here, and good evening to everybody online um, watching us today. Thank you for joining us for this press conference, which we've titled Girls in Space. And if you're looking for a practical story about Africa and the fourth industrial revolution, uh, we have one for you. Um, I, I'm very pleased to introduce, um, here we have with us today, we have Judy Sandrock, who's co-founder and uh, co-founder and CEO of uh, Mido Space Economic Development. Also with us is Carla de Klerk, who's a uh, program manager at Mido Space. Thank you very much for joining us. Okay, the way we will run today is we will invite them to share with us uh, some updates and then we will be able to go to the audience to have an interaction with a few questions. I may have one or two questions. Uh, I'd like to invite you to please uh, be interactive with your questions as well. Let's help them tease out the story. Um, okay, so Judy, the floor is yours. I, I think I'm as curious as everybody else. Um, Yui, thank you. Yes, thank you very much. Um, Mido Space. Uh, MIDO is an acronym for the Meta Economic Development Organization, and what we do is we run economic development programs. Our tagline and our primary goal is building the economy one job at a time. Two years ago, uh, with everybody starting to talk about the fourth industrial revolution, we realized that what we had to do as a continent yeah. is really get ready uh, so that we can take full advantage of that industrial revolution. So we have started our Women in STEM program, STEM being an acronym, acronym for science, technology, engineering, and maths. And in order to make this really inspirational, what we did is we bought Africa's first private satellite and a launch, and that launch is gonna happen at the end of this year. What we've also done is with our partners around the world is we've been able to invest in a number of further launches subsequent to the one at the end of this year. And we'll have a satellite going into orbit every year between now and 2020. That's amazing. Yes, and the thing is, Jimmy, it's, it's very nice to buy a satellite and a launch, but then what are you gonna do with it? But what we're really going to do is we are having young women in high school designing the experiments that are gonna fly on those satellites. Wow. We've got to the point now where we've already got two experiments that have been designed and uh, they're being built. Fantastic. And uh, what we did is in the last school holiday, which was during April, we had the, the young women come in to our Armido Center in Cape Town and what they did is that they workshopped with space engineers, space engineering engineers on what can we make possible? Yeah. Um, how do we put it together? And uh, our colleague Bianca has a team uh, of five engineers who are currently building the first payload for that satellite. That's amazing. Now if I can just, maybe just to make sure I fully understand. So the first satellite is going to be launched this year. Yes. And this is the first kind of privately owned satellite being launched in Africa. Absolutely. All the other satellites have gone up from universities Okay. And uh, what we've done is we've decided to turn everything on its head. And it's all about what does the next generation want to do with technology? Okay. Uh, you know, the thing is, uh, you know, somebody of my age isn't going to be very good with coming up with innovative concepts. Okay. You know, when I, went, when I studied engineering, we didn't have internet. <laughs> and I know that for you, you know, it's like, how can you live without internet? Absolutely. You know, I actually went through a whole d engineering degree without internet. Absolutely. So I'm never going to come up with the right ideas. Okay, but uh, again, just to nail the story here. So we do have a story, first satellite going up, 2016. It's this year, yes. it's real. Now, I heard a second story. Did you say every year to 2020? So that's five yes. by 2020. Yes. All right. That's, I yes. think, quite a powerful story as well. Now, before we go to... Come on to you, Clara. I have another question. How do you go from um, educating girls in STEM to buying a satellite? I don't see an immediate connection. Is there a story there as well? Yes, there is a story. What it is is that we realized with the fourth industrial revolution on its way was that we had to have 
a young women in STEM program. It's something that uh, is globally recognized as a challenge of introducing young women to STEM careers. And uh, so what we did is we went out and we had a look at globally what is best practice. And we found a program in Eastern Kentucky in the USA. Okay. It's a very, very impoverished region of the USA and they run this space trek program. And really? it's been incredibly successful. They've been running it now for six years. And over the first five years, they were able to track how they had young women on the Space Trek program. They then were encouraged to apply at university. Well, first of all, you know, get good school marks yeah. so that they could apply for university. And last year, they had their first graduates in engineering coming out of their local university. Okay who had five years before that been engaged on one of these workshops. Okay. So we saw that this could work. Okay. There were results, it's a model that works, so we've brought it to Africa and we've customized it for our environment. Fantastic, I think this is a great op opportunity to bring Carla in. All right, so Carla, does it work? And how does it work? So we've, we've, we've taken this model and adapted it at home. Can you tell us really how does it work and does it work? So I guess it's always quite difficult to measure what does it mean when it works? Do we want a whole generation of engineers and that's it? Um, no, we want to get girls interested and excited and passionate about STEM or whatever it may be that they want to do. Um, it's about inspiring them to work hard at school so that they can go to university, so they can study something. and add to their economy. So if they like maths, it doesn't mean they have to go study mathematics and become a mathematician. They can start designing websites, they can work in construction, they can do anything. And that's really what we want to prove to them, that you can really do anything. Um, with the last batch of, of girls that, that came and started designing the satellite, one half of them now want to become satellite engineers, the other half want to become astronauts. And you know, why not? We want to empower these girls to take responsibility for their lives, to take power, to take pride in their lives. So I'd say, yeah, that, that, that works. And when, how many batches have you had and when did you start the program? So we started exactly a year ago. Last year on June 16, we had a big launch event where we started giving workshops in designing uh, small robots using basic electronics. So over that past year, we worked with 120 young women uh, over in Cape Town, around in South Africa. Um, and in, with those 120 young women, we have chosen 20 that we have gone further with um, in the end they have to have passion, they have to be interested in what we want to teach them. Yeah. So that is the big, the big, for, the big um, motivator, how, how we go further with young women. So now on Youth Day, 16 of June, we're actually going to have a big uh, hackathon, a robotics building day with over 200 young women. So we are growing and we are building and we are looking to eventually reach 2,000 girls within a year. Okay, um, I have to be really careful with them. They seem to have lots of stories that they package. So this is another story. So this is 6th of June, Hackathon. 6th, 16th. 16th of June, on, thank you. On South African Youth Day. Fantastic, 16th of June, there's a hackathon, a youth hackathon with over 200 women, uh, yes. girls. Where they're going to be programming, coding, and designing robots. Okay, you heard it here first, and you can break that story first. So that's in about five weeks. Um, okay, at this point, I think I'd love to open it up because I see quite an engaged uh, audience. So if you have a question that will help you make this story more relevant to your audience, please put your hand up. Otherwise, I'll keep asking questions. There's a mic that's roaming. If you have a question you want to ask right now, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm the converted. Um, but for the benefit of everybody else, uh, I'm Lade Araba from the Vizielo Foundation, which is based in Nigeria, which shares um, a similar mission with uh, the MEDA organization. And I'm just curious to know, um, what is the criteria 
that you utilize in selecting the girls that you work with? I know you talked about you started out with 120 and then you, um, I guess, whittled it down to 20, but in general, when you're looking at the week-long space um, boot camps, what types of girls are you targeting? Okay, so let me just explain how exactly the program works. Uh, the program is divided into phases. We have phase one, which is space prep, where we go out to the schools and we teach them how to build a, a small, very basic robot. It's a one-day workshop that we do on Saturdays at the school, no cost to the girls whatsoever. And it's fun, it's exciting, it's interesting. And then we, we tell, tell them, please go to our website and apply, get your name onto our server. So then eventually we accumulate to 100, 120 young girls that we have who have applied to go further. Or some who don't have applied, who said, you know, this is just not for me, I, I, I'm done. And then we interview each of these girls. Um, and <laughs> when we interview them, they're, they're extremely afraid. They're worried we're going to give them a maths equation to solve or do some science for us. Um, no. We, we just want to see interest and passion. We want to see whether they do want to go further and whether they are able to work in a team. Um, so that is all that we require from them. So that means they'll go through to the next phase, which is space trek. This is a week long boot camp um, where we take all the chosen girls away, away from their homes, away from everything, into the middle of nowhere and we work to design a, a very basic satellite. I actually have one here. This is called a cricket satellite. It's slightly more complex than anything else, but this cricket satellite measures the temperature of the atmosphere up to eight kilometers. So each of these girls, they learn how to build this, how to put it together, how it works, and then they send it up with a weather balloon and they need to track it with the radio. They need to, to read the data, they need to work out what is the temperature after, by just getting a ton of numbers and then at the end of the week they have to do a big presentation explaining what they learned, how does it work, what is the satellite. And then generally these girls, after they've, they've done space trek, they're so excited and so interested to go further. We don't have to ask them, we'll just give them a call and say, listen, we're having a satellite building workshop in, the, in this, the coming school holiday, will you be interested? And they change their holiday plans so that they come, can come to us and build satellites. Fantastic, thank you so much. Um, do we, if you have any a question, please put your hand up, please. Thanks, Oliver Cowd from the Forum. I, I may have missed his apologies, but I'd love to know whether you can scale this up and take it to other parts of Africa. Thank Oli, you, th th thank you very much for that question. We certainly are scaling it up uh, to take it to the entire continent of Africa. In Mido, we never attempt anything that we, uh, unless we know we can scale it first. So the whole way we've designed the program is for scalability. And what we've come to realize in the first year of running the program is that we've got three vital ingredients. The first is that we need to have free access to internet. Um, as soon as we start running the workshops, we find that a lot of the young women start taking responsibility for their own education and for their own learning. So, in other words, not having a great maths or science teacher isn't a barrier. All the information that they need is out there on the internet. They just need to be able to accept, uh, access it for nothing. So, free access to internet is the first thing. The second thing is we need to have a local university with a technical faculty. Because the model is that we utilize undergraduate students to run the space preps on the weekends. Yeah. They get paid for it. It's great student work. And also we use the uh, post-grad students to help us with the, the boot camps as well as to start building the payloads. So we need to have that university, that technical university. And the third thing is we need to have a corporate sponsor who wants to have impact within that region. So what we've got is we haven't got any physical constraints to those three aspects, mm -hmm. and we've got incredible relationships with a number of universities, and we've been in great conversations with a number of universities so that we can actually roll out across the continent. 
When the satellite's in orbit, it's in a polar orbit, so what's going to happen is that it's going to be crossing over the African continent every 90 minutes. So it is a program that we have to run across the continent. It's not only just for one country. This is something that we want to do um, as Africans for Africa. Fantastic. Thank you very much. I believe we had a question in the front. You can get a microphone. Thank you. I want, my name is Ethan Tashavia. I work with the New Times Rwanda. I wanted to know if this, the discussions also involve our, some of the universities here in Rwanda. Because Rwanda is, we understand Rwanda is one of the countries that are so much focused on, uh, you know, promoting technology, especially with girls. And uh, my second question goes to, to you as well, maybe the two of you. What do you see as the future of girls in, in ICT or in IT? Thank but you. It's the, thank you. Should I take the first? Should yeah. I take the first question, and then you go into the, yes. the future of the girls? In terms of Rwanda, we have we very, very deep in conversation with your ministry for youth and ICT. Uh, in terms of, uh, we've already had uh, an engagement with, with the university here in Kigali, because it would be absolutely perfect to be able to utilize the, the, the university. The, the ministry for youth and ICT is clearly very, very on board with the whole program. So we've got uh, two of the factors in place. And uh, now what we're doing is here at the forum is we're gonna have a call to action to say, uh, please, we need, a, we need a sponsor who can sponsor the program in Rwanda because we're ready to go. Fantastic. Okay, so for uh, number two then, the future of girls in ICT. Um, well, we want to build a strong, competitive African economy. Um, if you look at the stats, uh, less than 14% of all STEM careers are currently held by women worldwide. And it's also predicted that by 2020, 80% of all careers will be STEM related. So there's quite a big gap. Currently, women don't feature in the STEM fields. They don't feature in the development fields of developing technology or apps or medicine for that for that matter so in short we want to see girls starting to participate in the economy we want to push them to go further to, to know that the sky is the limit so yeah the future of girls in ICT is to take part in it fantastic thank you very much if we have a question we have a question in the back thank you my name is Victor Kotebe presenting African leadership magazine in Nigeria I'm just curious about uh, the privately owned satellite. When you say you buy, you, you intend to buy one each year, how much does each cost? Great, should I, should yeah. I try to uh, tackle yeah, that question? Yes. Mm. Okay, uh, certainly, question. Um, what it is is that the, the small format satellite industry in the, globally has really, really expanded quite rapidly. So, um, before, yes, so what it is is that to, in order to buy a small format satellite in a launch, one's looking at anywhere between 100,000 US dollars and 250,000 US dollars. So that's for the satellite and the launch. Now, when we talk about a small format satellite, oh, sorry, Carla. No. Hmm? Uh, she's just lost her payload. Um, this is the size of the satellite. It's a CubeSat, and it's exactly a liter. It's 10 centimeters cubed. So the days of sending up something the size of a bus are gone. So uh, this is the format that we're looking at. And there are hundreds of satellites that are being launched every year uh, around, uh, around the world uh, to go and actually perform experiments. So uh, that's kind of like what you're looking at in terms of numbers. Uh, there's also something else that I'd like to mention and from an economic development perspective yeah. and an entrepreneurial opportunity is if we have a look, this is, the, this is the latest format of a satellite. This is called a pocket cube. So now this is a lot smaller than a cube set. So here we are looking at um, five centimeters cubed. And this is what the format's going to. So with the electronics getting smaller and smaller, um, the payloads are getting a lot lighter and it's going to cost a lot less 
to, to launch. Um, this is actually made from electro electronics components that have been developed in South Africa and we're manufacturing in South Africa. So we are not importing these components. It's not as if we're we are making uh, a middleman rich, an importer rich. So what we've got is we've got the components and they, they, they clip together. This is the, these are the components that the young women work with when they come on, on, the, on the camps. And um, we're able to mass produce these components, these various components, they're, they're, they're power modules, there are uh, coding modules, all of that kind of thing. Um, but also they're robust enough to be able to actually go up uh, into space so they, so they can handle the launch. Now the thing is that when we start rolling out in Rwanda, for example, for every space prep that's going to be run on a Saturday, there's an opportunity for an undergraduate student here to be able to actually uh, utilize the electronics and it becomes a small micro franchise in itself. So there is a whole enterprising component that's attached to this. So it's, um, it's very much a private sector initiative as opposed to being a purely academic venture. Fantastic. Thank you. Do we have any other comments or questions? Thank you. We have one more there. We have, we have more questions. All right, let's go. Please. Well, my name is Ben Ngubane. I'm chairman of ESCOM, the South African Power Utility. We're quite excited by this development. Fantastic. We have a Young Scientists Expo program, which we support and fund and brings in a lot of young people from schools. We also have an ESCOM Women's Advancement Program through which we aim to have a 50-50 share in the senior and top management of ESCOM, and then of course going down further the ladder as we go on. So this is quite exciting. I used to be Minister of Science and Technology for South Africa. Yes. Peter there, my friend, you know, we, we, we get excited about pushing young people into science because that is the future. Semiconductor technology is going to shape all our lives from virtual reality to clean energy, etc. And space is the most digital thing you can think of. So when women get into that stream of thinking digitally, that holds a great hope for Africa. So thank you. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Yes. Thank you. All right, we have another question in the back. And that's a great story, by the way. ESCOM chairman, former minister, excited by the initiative. So that's another story. You're getting more than you bargained for. <laughs> OK, um, uh, my name is Zinzi. Uh, I'm from Barclays, Africa. So I've got two questions for you. The first one is um, the girls who are out there in the deep uh, rural areas, how are you reaching out to them? Because they do have potential. Uh, some of them, they spend a lot of time going to the wells to fetch water. How do we get them out of that space? And then the second one is uh, this uh, SK, SKA project. Uh, what's your involvement in that space? And uh, is there any plan to create uh, a pipeline of, uh, of uh, youth, and especially girls, who are actually going to be trained so that they will be able to take the SKA project uh, forward. Okay, so um, I'll take number one there. Um, how do we reach the girls in the rural areas? Well, Mido has two mobile learning centers. Uh, these are two big trucks that are kitted out with everything. Internet, workstations, power, it is a completely independent truck on its own. It doesn't need anything whatsoever. So this is how we run most of the space prep programs. We go to schools that don't have uh, infrastructure of Wi-Fi or, or power cables everywhere. So this mobile truck, it's a mobile learning center, goes to the school. We actually bring all the girls inside to work inside the truck, build all the robots in there. Um, learn in there, experience in there, use the Wi-Fi in there. Um, so we've always had a saying of everyone needs to learn no matter what their location. 
um, just because you happen to live in a city where there's so many outreach programs and NGOs, it doesn't mean that the guy way far in the Eastern Cape doesn't have that right as well. So Mido goes as far as we possibly can. Yes. Thank you. And if if I can also come wait, in, please. let me come in on that one yeah. as well. Cindy, thank you very much. Uh, a lot of my background as an engineer was uh, in mining communities, uh, in the mining industry, uh, as well as pulp and paper. Uh, currently, 50% of South Africa's population is rural. Uh, if we take a, a country like um, Kenya, we're looking at 85% of the population is rural. So our model has to be where we can prioritize rural communities because if we've got a predominantly rural population on our continent, that is where we have to go. So as, as Carla mentions, that is why our model includes where we actually go into communities using our, our trucks that, that are kitted out um, as, as mobile laboratories. Um, you, you mentioned SKA, yeah. the Square Kilometre Array Project at Carnarvon in the Northern Cape. Certainly we have. We've uh, visited Carnarvon. It's, uh, it's one drive, <laughs> I must say. And um, the team is very, very, very keen. They have got an outreach program. They have got a commitment that they've made in terms of outreach. Uh, but also at the same time, they're on very tight project uh, deadlines. So the conversations we're having with them at the moment is about pooling our resources so that we can actually, we can do that outreach program for them um, so that we can get people very interested in astronomy space and especially with it being a radio telescope and we're using radio technology to communicate with the satellites, that, that's absolutely key. So the, there's a very nice alignment. We have a strong relationship with SANSA, which is the South African National Space Agency. Uh, they've endorsed our program and we're also doing outreach with them, uh, with, with their team. So we've, we've got a very nice uh, linkages over there. Only on Monday, it was this last, the last few days, on Monday, I was having a conversation with a company by the name of Biotherm Energy, and they've got massive solar farms in the Northern Cape of South Africa. Very, very remote, uh, tiny communities there, um, small number of children in school, you know, one of the communities has only got seven youngsters uh, studying maths and science. Uh, in their final years of schooling. So there is, there is a huge challenge, uh, not only in terms of engaging young people, but the thing is that what often happens is that companies find it very difficult nowadays to get engineers and technologists to go into these areas and work there on solar farms, on yeah. mines, on projects like SKA. Nowadays, all professionals have got professional spouses, so one has to have jobs for two people and careers for two Absolutely. people when one's looking at rural areas. So getting a city slicker to move out to a rural area is virtually impossible. Yeah. What we need to do is we need to encourage the youngsters where they live to pursue these careers, go to university, and then go back home and now what they can do is now they can build the economy at home. Yeah. They can earn those top salaries at home and in that way generate that local economy. Uh, too often what we see is that there will be a resource, whether it's the sun or whether it's gold or whether it's iron ore, um, and the people in that community are not benefiting directly from that resource. It's the people in the big cities who are the suppliers and who are the professionals moving to that area. So you're absolutely right. If we're going to be looking at the fourth industrial revolution and we're going to have, we have a proper look at our continents, yeah. we have to take these factors into consideration when we run a program like All this. All right, thank you so much. I see more hands. We're almost out of time. If it's okay, I'll take one more and then you'll have a chance to all interact. Let's take one more right here. Thank you. Thanks very much. When you talk about young people and the people you encounter, and you just mentioned the SKA project, we've heard a lot at the forum about Africa needing to catch up with the rest of the world. I mean, do you think this is catching up, or do you think the human resources that you've seen mean that Africa could become leading edge 
in space and technology. Great question, thank you. And I'd like to invite both of you. So one of you can answer the question, but I'd like both of you to probably uh, close as well. So maybe beyond answering the question, if you can make some final comments or remarks so that we can let you all go. I know you're all very busy. Thank so you. to answer your question, firstly, we do have a bit of catching up to do. Um, but that doesn't mean we're lagging too far behind that in a few years, by 2020, even we can't have caught up already africa has so many much potential we have so many individuals so so many passionate individuals so excited to work in africa and make it the continent it should be um we do have a bit of work yes but why the hell can't we catch up um we at Mido believe there's no problem there's a solution so it's not that Africa is in a dark place. No, we are working towards going forwards. Um, we are going to space. We're having the first private satellite going up. We ha I know of at least six other satellites being developed currently in South Africa. So there is so much going around, but let's start at the basics. Let's start at the youth, get them to build their economy for us. Fantastic, thank you so much. Judy? I think, Peter, uh, what we saw with the uptake of GSM on the African continent, uh, you know, the thing is that the Americans had invested decades and billions of dollars in uh, landlines, and uh, the technology changed, and suddenly uh, we utilized GSM right across our constant continent within a year. And exactly the same thing is happening with the space industry. The Americans have invested billions and billions of dollars over many decades since the 1950s in building their space programs. And uh, now we've got a format that looks like this. You know, and the thing is that what we're going to find is that on our continent, we're going to leapfrog. And we're going to be able to position ourselves absolutely perfect for this format. So I don't think we need to worry about being linear and thinking, we are currently lagging behind, so therefore we're always going to be behind. What we're going to do is we're going to leapfrog. So what we need to do is we now need to start focusing on how can we start launching satellites from the African continent? Um, you know, there's one thing that they say, rocket science is not really rocket science. It's actually pretty easy. You know, it's, um, uh, the technology is there. And uh, it's not even uh, priority technology. Uh, what we need to do is we need to make sure that we can launch from our own continent and we can take advantage of this massive market that's developing out there. we in the right place at the right time. We're not lagging behind. That's fantastic. Thank you so much. And true to form, that is yet another story right at the end of the press conference. So disruption in the space industry opens up an opportunity for Africa to leapfrog. That's a great story. You can write it. You've got the content. I want to say thank you so much. I want to thank you all for your engagement. Uh, we have Africa's first private satellite to be launched this year. We have five by 2020. We have a model that produces these outcomes in a very scalable way. It's uh, f interactive, it's fun, and it actually stimulates and supports private sector development as well. So it's not all pie in the sky, it's really concrete. And we know the ESCOM chairman is excited about this as well. So you can write about that. Thank you so much for your time. They'll be around um, for more questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.